ginger, sporty, scary, baby, and Bosch, the all-conquering Spice Girl! I've been in the music business for 30 odd years or whatever, and, and I've never ever seen anything like this, and I probably will never again. We knew it was going to be huge, but we didn't realise quite how big it was going to be. They were pinching Prince Charles's arse. They were, you know, having a cup of tea with Nelson Mandela. I mean, hello. The sort of global phenomenon of their fame, I think, I don't know how anybody takes that on board. Give me, give me For tumultuous years, these five young women transformed themselves from desperate wannabes to the biggest pop act on the planet. But today, the number ones have dried up, the fans have grown up, and the once famous five have all but broken up. This is the story of seven pivotal moments, seven decisive days in the Spice Girls journey, from obscurity to world domination, and halfway back again. We haven't got any decent songs, we haven't really got anything to work on. They basically just did a moonlight flip. We are upset and saddened by Jerry's departure, but we are very supportive in whatever she wants to do. We've done it, we've done it, we've sacked Simon. What, the nation dislike you that much? Really, she didn't need the Spice Girls anymore. It's all over. It's Monday, the 1st of June, 1998. Come back to what you know. Another Monday morning rush hour, and a nation returns to work. But for the Spice Girls on this momentous day, there will be anything but business as usual. What a great song that was, Embrace, and Come Back to What You Know. Yesterday, number three on the charts. Uh, have you just woken up? Morning, Foxy at 95.8 Capital FM. It's uh, Monday the 1st of June. If you've missed the headlines, Gaza is out of the England squad. Hoggler sent him home from La Manga in Spain. But if you've just woken up, here's the biggie today. Jerry Halliwell has left the Spice Girls. Is there life for the other four? We'll have to wait and see. sitting down talking about the show looked up at the monitor and it was like oh jeez look at that Jerry's left the band I was coming back into the Virgin office and I got out of a cab and I can remember this really well the phone went and she said Paul it's Jerry and I was like yeah she said look I'm leaving and there's people waving at me and coming past me and I'm thinking like oh, you know why did we ever invent mobile phones the Spice Girls' phenomenal success had been built on their image as an inseparable gang of five. Now the lid had blown on the tensions that had been simmering for years. But even now, they couldn't quite face the truth. Let you go. Jerry Halliwell's departure, the truth of it uh, is out there somewhere, and it really depends on who you believe. Certainly some of the things that are factually true were that the Spice Girls were doing the lottery show, uh, with Jerry Halliwell, and that uh, she never actually turned up on the tape. Baby! Porky! Scary! And Posh! Are we not missing somebody? We are. Oh. Unfortunately, Jerry's not very well tonight, so get well soon, Jerry. Actually, the Spice Girls have been around for three years. None of them have ever had flu. They've all always appeared on every TV show, whether they're dying or not, and suddenly, one of them has flew on what is one of the biggest, well, what was one of the biggest TV shows they could ever do. Hmm. The sick note may have said flu, but the symptoms suggested something far more serious, a chronic case of ego rivalry. I think she left because she was one of the most headstrong members of the band, and she probably got bored of doing a lot of talking, and I would have thought maybe they got bored of doing a lot of listening to what she had to say. I think just the tension rose. They begrudged her making the decisions, forcing them to do stuff that they weren't happy with, and equally she wasn't happy with the way that they were going. 
Jerry wanted the group to do also on the same day an appearance uh, on behalf of the breast cancer charity that she'd become um, very involved with or that she felt very strongly that the, the group ought to become involved with. And there was some disagreement about this, so that was ruled out. No! If she was told that by Mel B, I could imagine Jerry would have probably stormed off because I think there was quite a power battle within the girls between Mel B and Jerry. In the end, it was Mel B or Jerry, simple as that. And the other girls had to make a decision. And the other girls got behind Mel B. Jerry Halliwell has left the Spice Girls. The news has just been confirmed at a press conference in central London. Jerry's lawyer, Julian Turton, read a statement. Jerry leaving that day, I remember just thinking, it's all over. This is a message to the fans. Sadly, I would like to confirm that I have left the Spice Girls. This is because of differences between us. Right from the start, the other four girls said, no, we're going to go on, and they were very determined about that. But I think mostly what was behind that was in the, they were in the middle of a world tour. And there was a lot of money riding on that. There's no way they could have not continued with that. Their heads told the other four to go on, but the question was whether the heart had been ripped out of the Spice Girls. If you had one image of 90s pop, Jerry Halliwell, Brits, opening song, Union Jack dress. And that's why, for me, when Jerry left, it was never the same. Never the same. I'm sure the group will continue to be successful, and I wish them all the best. P.S. I'll be back. With her flair for self-publicity proven, Jerry's knack for self-reinvention was about to become legendary. One minute, she's got her tits out, and she's in her little Union Jack mini dress. And the next minute, she's the sleek blonde UN ambassador and it's that really awkward moment when a pop star says please take me seriously well, I'm gonna really really try and learn a lot about this and I hope that the world will learn with me she was addicted to attention and she'd rather have negative attention than just be forgotten about Look at me. You can take it. a year later Jerry Halliwell was reincarnated as a solo artist with the first of three consecutive number ones. It was as if Operation Relaunch Jerry had been planned with military precision. Jerry is a very, very clever person. Never underestimate Jerry Halliwell. You know me, I've got illusions of grandeur. Look at me. Jerry Halliwell had very astutely witnessed how successful Robbie Williams had been by being the first person out of Take That. And I think that Jerry quite fancied cashing in on the fame and notoriety she could get from being the first person out of the Spice Girls. What was curious as well is that she was the big, busty, larger-than-life character, and she has shrunk down to this almost unrecognizable physical shape of what she was. Can I start again? Starting again meant a grueling physical and mental overhaul for the former buxom and bubbly ginger spice. I think when she's unhappy, she thinks, I oh, know, I'll just get a new haircut, or I'll, I'll just lose another half a stone, or I'll tell you what, I'll start dressing like a businesswoman for a while. And it just shows um, sort of a total lack of confidence in herself or being comfortable in her own skin, really. I met her when she was launching It's Raining Men, which I suppose is the, the height of her solo career, really. And a couple of the girls actually got quite upset. The fact that she'd got so thin, her makeup artist had to spray her skin with oil and water just to keep it moisturised during the shoot, and all her clothes had to be sort of pinned behind her back because she was so, so tiny. It was quite sad, really, to think that, you know, this is somebody who stood for so much for women, and yet, really, she seemed to be a little bit of an emotional wreck, in actual fact. I love Rich and Jude. I think <laughs> oh, they're very, so nice. Oh, we're very fond of you. <laughs> when you meet her, she's very much like, oh, I feel we've bonded, you know, I feel there's a, a spiritual thing between us now. No, no, love, there isn't, but <laughs> it's nice that you want to think that way. You're quite a complex person, aren't you? One minute she's the happiest, bounciest girl in the world, and the next minute she just seems like this massive, depressed thing. Jerry had battled with eating disorders for years, but even when she thought she'd found her perfect physique, it was no guarantee of happiness. 
she had won the lottery, hadn't she, really, many times over by being in the Spice Girls. But, I mean, and I still think an awful lot of the time you can feel a bit sorry for Jerry because she seems a bit of a sad case. Jerry's single-minded ambition had threatened to finish off the Spice Girls for good. But three years earlier, it had been the driving force as the newly formed group sped up the M1 on the trail of fame, fortune, and a record producer. Without me, they're nothing. I promise. At the moment, we're not really anything because we haven't got any decent songs. We haven't really got anything to work on. At the beginning of 1995, the Spice Girls had no record deal, no songs and no contacts. But they did have an ambitious manager who had picked them from 400 wannabes in search of a female take that. We have really sort of developed the girls and, you know, we've got them sort of to a presentable stage that they could impress the writer producers to get them on board in order for us to then take it forward uh, to get it signed. But on the 9th of May 1995, the eve of their first real recording session with an A-list producer, they walked away from it all. This was the Tuesday that shook the Spice Girls. At the time, I'd done um, Take That and Danny Minogue, a couple of other things like that. And Chris said, we've got this five-girl kind of pop R&B project going. I said, oh, what's that about? I want to do that. Can I work with them? And um, we booked a studio in Sheffield, which is, you know, where, where I was living. We really wanted Elliot to be part of it and kind of crack, crack the sound. And that was kind of one of our sort of key sessions, really. After a year of constant rehearsals on wages of 60 pounds a week, the group was nearing its first professional recording session, but they were far from happy. It was at the end of the day, one of the sort of rehearsal days, and a big argument was happening. No, but that's bollocks. But about I think it's because you're who, who, who influenced about the army trousers? Who got these in? Calm down, calm down. The girls wanted to get the, the address out of us for Elliot. And we just said, look, that's irrelevant at the moment. There's some issues that have to be sorted out. And the girls kind of stormed out and were kind of gone for dust. Usually you get a phone call from the management company, oh, the artist's coming up, and everything's sorted, you know. No word. So I thought, oh, something's kicking off here, you know. They basically just did a moonlight flip. They just uh, left a little note saying they were sorry and that they'd gone elsewhere. Half of them didn't even tell their mums because this was like their first proper job. They didn't want to tell their mums that basically they'd done a bunk. We've said goodbye. I was actually in a friend's house. It was this beautiful big country manor house and uh, mobile phone went and it was Jerry and Mel B. So um, Jerry came on, and uh, excitable as she is, and said, um, we need to talk to you desperately. I said, wow, uh, <laughs> what, what's the situation? So well, we've driven to Sheffield and uh, started phoning all the recording studios and, until we found someone who knew you. And it just happened to be that the first one we called was the, f the one that we were booked in. They got your mobile phone number and all the rest of it. So at that point, I thought, well, that's pretty dedicated. This friend of mine's dad answered the door and Jerry flung herself on him thinking that he was Elliot Kennedy. And he was like, well, this is very nice and stuff, but who are you? And she said, oh, I'm Jerry, are you Elliot? And he says, no, <laughs> he's upstairs in the studio. So, all right, so they introduced them to me and Jerry went through the same routine again and flung herself on me and all the rest of it. So it was kind of, kind of fun uh, introduction, shall we say. Take me away. To walk out of a situation with no record deal, with nothing recorded to speak of, nothing tangible at all, um, showed phenomenal bravado. That bravado and a serious charm offensive had taken them so far. But as events caught up with them, it was time to produce something more material. The day we started, bear in mind I'd got Mel B and Jerry with me, and the phone went. 
we spoke to Elliot and just said, look, um, the session's not going to happen. The girls are, are ill. They've all come down with the flu. And I thought, oh, no, this is not a good situation. I said, sorry, two of them are here. It's nothing to do with me. And they kind of said, well, look, we're not paying for the studio time. So the girls said, well, we'll pay for it. We'll pay for it ourselves. So they literally, I mean, they were penniless. You know, they hadn't got anything, but they went to the cash machines themselves and they got all the money out for the studio, you know, which was symbolic at how determined they were, you know. Well, I think you can say that that was the moment that girl power was really came into its own, was really born, if you like. These five girls had the sheer confidence, the sheer balls, if you like, to just throw it all in, and they just knew that their destiny was somewhere else. We don't want to just have a one-hit wonder, you know, we want to stay up there. You know, we want to do Top of the Pops and smash it to Pole Winners Party and all that kind of thing. A lot of that came down to Jerry. She was very much together on uh, where they think they should go from this point onwards. I am a true wannabe. Yeah, I put my hand on my heart, I admit it. Yeah, I'm a wannabe. Just 10 months after their penniless trip up the M1 to Sheffield, the Spice Girls found their way to a new manager, a lucrative record deal, and most importantly of all, to the top of the charts. Wednesday, 31st July 1996, is the next of the seven days that shook the Spice Girls. What you think about that? Now you know how I feel. Say you can handle my life. Whilst they were recording their first ever live appearance on Top of the Pops, one inspired piece of tabloid journalism was to change their names and identities forever. If you wanna be my they came to Elstree where we filmed Top of the Pops and uh, did the performance the Wednesday night, and while they were editing it together in the studios, we were back in the magazine offices, sort of working out some ideas, really. If you wanna be my lover. <laughs> we cut all their heads out and photos and stuck them on little spice bottles and put them in a spice rack and like let change the labels, you know, and you get like your sort of fennel label or posh on it. That's a lady. Mel B, I think, said, oh, can I be prostitute spice? I'm the love goddess. Mel C. For a minute, was scouse spice, so she had a, a bit of a lucky escape there, I think. And this is, she's innocent, but really, she's oh, half the I am. And then it was Jerry that we sort of debated about quite a bit, and she was very, very nearly saucy spice. She's I a ginger. Not. <laughs> yeah, ginger nut. Mel B was like, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm not scary. I'm not scary. But it was too late. A magazine such as Tom Pops magazine is quite a powerful magazine. And actually, it stuck. And that, it's one of the things that's made them as famous as they are. The great thing was they hadn't all got one image that they were trying to be. They were every different style. They weren't having to play roles. This is kind of how they were, and they just become that. Ginger! Baby! Sporty! Scary! And plus! <laughs> The perfectly packaged pop stars, under the guidance of their infamously shrewd manager, Simon Fuller, were going straight to marketing heaven. They each had their own identity, which people could relate to, and you always had your favourites. And that was a huge appeal, especially with, you know, the younger audience. Baby. What Simon Fuller was fascinated by and has replicated since is the concept of a brand. We like certain chocolates because of the brand. We buy certain trainers because of the brand. And I think he thought that if you could create a brand, a concept, that people will buy into that really easily. Are you human? There's Victoria. There's Jerry. Mousy. And Malby. They were just visually everywhere. You know, they were on Pepsi commercials. They were on crisp commercials, but not just in this country, in other countries as well. We talk about girl power, you know, new generation, it's new feeling, and Pepsi, you know, projects the same thing. You could have asked someone in India or out of Mongolia about a Spice Girl, they would know. It was incredible. The Spice alter egos had been good business, but now they'd taken on a life of their own. I'm always going to be seen as Baby Spice, you know, the sweet and innocent one. Even when I'm 
30. This person, sporty, posh, ginger, scary, was a created character who you never were in the first place. There was nothing contrived about ginger. I love ginger. Mm. I still do love ginger. But um, it's natural that you're going to progress and grow. Jerry went to the point of burying ginger spice in a coffin, which was very funny and very clever. But if you're a 12-year-old girl who loved ginger, that's quite sad, I think. The names worked to their advantage, obviously, in the beginning, but now they're just desperate to get rid of them. And, and I just don't know if they ever will. The problem was, as the band developed and, you know, inevitably the girls' egos developed, they didn't want to be seen as posh spice or scary spice and wanted to kind of develop their own personalities and bring their real personalities to the fore. Already I feel like I'm losing my identity. Last couple of days, I, like, I've been waking up and like, I have this really, really like, scary feeling that I don't know who I am. I think from the early days, Mel C found it quite tricky and I think she's, she's probably the most apparently damaged because she really wanted to be respected for her talent. And I don't think she was ever comfortable with the with the, with the frothy on the girl in the tracksuit role. I think I want to be like one of them shadows, you know, when I'm about 40, wearing a shell suit from down the market. <laughs> shell suit now. I remember being in Istanbul for the um, Pepsi concerts that they staged. I came out of my room to go to the concert, and, and Mel C came out at the same time, and she was in floods of tears. But she kind of wiped the tears away and started chatting, was fine, and, and off she went. You know, it was later, actually, quite some time later, that she, she admitted herself that she was going through a terrible time before, before, before those shows and really didn't want to do them. In fact, came very close not to do them. I want to. I can remember when Mel C was to be known from now on as Melanie Chisholm. I want to be someone else so I'll explode. Can you imagine phoning up the mirror in the sun and going, well, from now on, folks, you're not to call her Mel C, she's Melanie Chisholm. You think, Nobody cares whether she's Melanie Chisholm or Mel C. She's Sporty Spice. Mel! Hello. You look gorgeous! I'm put a bit of an image change tonight. Do you like it? I remember writing a story about how she complained to management that she was sick of being the only glamorous one. She didn't like that because everyone else got more attention. So for a while they glammed her up, but it didn't really work. She's sort of bulked up, she's thinned down. You know, I don't think she's very happy. I think anyone who became a child star has that dichotomy of they want to escape that tag, that persona, but at the same time, if they don't know who they are, there's nothing to replace it with. Before long, this growing identity crisis would provoke the five Spice Girls to turn on the group's sixth member, Svengali Spice. The Thursday that shook the Spice Girls came hard on the heels of their finest hour. At the Brits Awards Bash of February 1997, they reigned supreme as the mascots of Cool Britannia and the proud protégés of their revered manager, Simon Fuller. Simon Fuller has jet black hair and a, and a George Hamilton tan at all times. You never see interviews with Simon Fuller. You rarely see him in the papers, because that's not the kind of life he wants to lead. He was sphinx-like. I have massive respect for Simon Fuller and really think he's, he's a bloody clever guy at doing pop music. You know, he's done it since with S Club 7. And now, obviously, with Pop Idol, he's been very much behind the scenes and very much involved in that. And now Gareth and Will's careers. Fuller's just a genius when it comes to understanding pop, understanding the markets, understanding who buys what kind of record, putting it all together and wrapping it up into a big deal. Records and the best manager in the whole wide world, Simon Fuller! But at the height of their success, the Spice Girls turned the tables and they became the managers of Simon Fuller's destiny. Thursday, November the 6th, 1997, will be remembered as the night when they lit the blue touch paper. been in South Africa with them the few days before. They'd been out performing for Prince Charles, for the Prince's Trust in front of Nelson Mandela, which was a huge deal, a real honor for them. And then they flew out to Rotterdam for the MTV Awards, and that's where it all changed. It 
it was near bonfire night, I seem to remember. And um, my brother Simon had, had had a bad back injury, and he was laid out in the hospital in um, London. And I always think that if anybody's going to, you know, take over or anything, they always do it when the, you know, the person that they're taking over from isn't around. The girls flew in from South Africa on the Wednesday afternoon. And on the Thursday morning at about nine o'clock, half past nine, I was sitting downstairs in the restaurant having breakfast with my security people. And one of the waiters came in and said, Mr. Judge, uh, Miss, Miss Mel B, Miss Mel B, Miss Mel B wants to see you. I said, and the way this guy was saying it, we forced someone to try to break into the room. So five security guys running up a staircase, get to the door, the door's open. And I walked in and she said to me, we've done it, we've done it. I said, we've done what? And she said, we've sacked Simon. And that was at 25 past nine Dutch time. But she said that they'd done it with a fax. Because of my loyalty to Simon, I actually went back into the room and said to the girls that I would be, I would be resigning as a security company for the Spice Girls. While the Spice Girls went ahead with their appearance at the night's awards show, Fuller's deposed management team was feeling dazed and confused. And I suppose I was one of the first people to hear it because uh, there I was on the spot, called in, and I was told. My colleague Nick Godwin rang me and said, um, the girls are leaving Simon. They've just told me this morning and they've asked me to call you. As their ex-manager was being fired by fax, the group he'd built from nothing basked in the glory of being named best group in the world. It's an honor to be even nominated against such fantastic acts like that, but to win it's just off its head, do you know what I mean? We just wanted to see for about 24 hours whether they wanted to change their mind. But that was, that was Nick and I asking them, you know, are you really sure this is what you want? Um, but no, they were adamant and that was it. Apart from this being the best day in our lives, this is about girl power. So come on! What really hurt me at the time was for a man who could give them so much success. And remember, it was all his writers and producers that they worked with, that not one of them bothered to pick up the phone and tell him personally as to why. Not one. It was all done through lawyers. And, you know, it was many months before anybody spoke to him. And I think whatever happens in business, you owe it to your colleagues to pick up the phone and to do it face to face and not to hide behind a lawyer. And I, for me, that's what made me angry. Within days, the group's new self-reliance faced a sobering test. They were booked to perform their biggest ever TV show in front of a select audience of celebrity guests. I had to call LWT to Nigel Lithgow and Andy Peters to break the news that all the organization and everyone around them was no longer there. Um, and it did have a huge effect on Nigel and Andy. I mean, they were ripping their hair out. Are you all ready? Yeah. Are you all ready for an audience with the Spice Girls? Because all the people that were working with them, you know, hair, makeup, security, etc., had all been hired by Simon. A lot of people had thought, well, actually, if they're not with Simon anymore, our loyalty is to Simon. They were in tears. Nikki was very upset. Nick was very upset. Everybody was very upset, including me. I was very upset because I thought they're not going to make this TV show. They're all just going to pull out. I think panic is an understatement. He was, um, he was fucking furious. <laughs> I just remember constantly during these rehearsals for an audience with, they would be literally on stage with a lawyer at the side of stage trying to talk to one of them saying, now this is what this clause means and this is what this clause means and if you do this you'll get... I mean it was the most awful part of my television career. They had to change accountants, you know, they had to change lawyers, it was across the board. So day to day, it was really, really tough for them, really tough. And I can remember seeing Jerry on the phone saying, oh, hi, I'm Jerry Halliwell, can I set up an account for some cars, please? Yet we need five limos. She was doing it herself on the phone. Halfway through this dress rehearsal, the girls would stop and say, do you know what? We'd like some food, sorry. We'd like something to eat. What now? We're halfway through a dress rehearsal. Yeah. 
I'll always remember Neil, one of the researchers, being sent in a limo to McDonald's to get a Big Mac for Mel B. Us phoning the LWT kitchen saying, we need some boiled peas. Victoria only eats boiled peas. Jerry saying, I just want sliced carrots, but not boiled raw. I mean, it was the most bizarre thing. Fuller had made millionaires of the Spice Girls and himself with unique royalty deals and lucrative sponsorships. So it seemed unlikely that his sacking had anything to do with business. One of the theories going around was that uh, Emma Bunton and Simon Fuller had had some kind of a romantic relationship. If you're lighting the fireworks, even a small one could get you into trouble. When I asked Emma about the alleged relationship between her and Simon and whether or not there's any truth in that, I mean, it was a bit of a long pause, which perhaps you can read into. But she then said, well, do you really think I would go out with a man who dyes his hair black? Well, that's the first time any of them had ever said anything even vaguely disrespectful about Simon. You don't have a life. You have a schedule. You are part of a well-oiled global machine. There are people everywhere working their butts off for you. I think Jerry was very instrumental in it. She had had enough, and she was whipping them up into such a frenzy that they all were just like, you know, we can do this on our own. And we feel it's about time that girls come first for a change. Yeah! yeah. Do you know what? I honestly believe they were in it for girl power. I seriously, seriously do. They really were convinced that between them, single-handedly, they would cause the world to believe that girl power was a real thing. Child and manager. <laughs> it's another classic pop scenario. It's happened right the way back to groups like the Monkees. You're created, you're moulded, you're given songwriters, you're packaged, you're sent out there, and you hit number one. After you've hit number one three or four times, well, you start to believe your own publicity. and You start sitting there thinking, we are the most successful girl band of all time. I am a genius singer. I have an Ivan Novello award for going zigga zag -ah in Wannabe. I think as well, Spice Girls is more than just music. It's more than just getting up there and performing. I think it's a, it's a philosophy that we take. You know, there shouldn't be no set rules. A, a person has to do this or do that. We can do anything. If you are fed that much shit on a daily basis, which they clearly were, you end up believing it. And um, it was just a stupid move, wasn't it? I'm sorry. No way! Fuller kept the Spice Girls, looked after them, sorted it out, and he kept it there as a whole package. As soon as that fax went to Simon Fuller, that's the day the Spice Girls start breaking up. Fuller's plans to make the Spice Girls millions hinged on cracking America. Many others had failed, but the Spice Girls succeeded on a scale achieved by no British act since the Beatles. We left America till last because it's a huge country and we wanted to treat it with the respect that it deserves. Well, as you can see, this premiere has all the makings of the biggest of Hollywood celebrations. The one thing that was very unusual was that the way that, that they really wanted to break America, I mean, there's this world domination. It was a crusade. For a tired old wreck executive like me, this is a dream come true. You've hit the jackpot, haven't you? We hope so. <laughs> They not only cracked America, they did it ridiculously quickly. And they were all over the American media in a matter of months on their most high-profile TV shows. Their pictures were all over Times Square. They were on, they were in the American media. America warmed them. America loved them. Do you really want, do you really, really want? Do you really want, do you really, really want? Do you really want, do you really, really want? Oh, oh, oh! It was brilliant. It was a great time, I think, for, you know, British pop music in general. What do you think of this Hollywood thing? It's mad. We love it. I can't believe it. The right band, the right bunch of girls, the right songs at the right time and managed by the right person. They're better than the village people. Definitely. Yeah. But with the American strategy freshly drawn up on Fuller's boardroom table, one maverick in Miami came terrifyingly close to wrecking it all before it started. Hey. You everything. This was the fifth day that shook the Spice Girls. Friday, 31st January, 1997. Miami's party station, Power 96. La, la, la. 
his friend came and brought me the CD um, of Wannabe. I um, put it on the radio and uh, I've got immediate response from the telephones. What was that? What is that? And who are these people? I wear the Spice Girls! Then shortly after that, I started getting phone calls and cease and desist orders through the fax machine from Virgin Records telling me to stop playing this particular song. They didn't want this to leak here. They had their plan. They weren't ready. So I, I told him, I said, well, there's really only one way you're going to get the song off the radio, and that's to guarantee that I get the first Spice Girls concert in America. <laughs> Temperature is dropping from the high 70s to 50 by tonight as Power 96 presents the Spice Girls live on stage. Power 96. Back home, they were treated like superstars. Here, it will be different. The Power 96 concert will be the Spice Girls' live debut in America. But that fact has been airbrushed out of official Spice history. We had about six acts that night. And they were all primarily Latin acts. So the response was great because it was all Latin salsa, merengue type music. And, uh, and then, you know, we bring the Spice Girls up. I remember walking through the crowd and seeing people just looking at them. Just looking at them. The crowd was just silent, just staring at them like if nothing happened. I mean, they no response whatsoever. They just were basically dead quiet and staring at him like they were from outer space. So basically, they bombed. You could only do those showcases so many times before someone was going to yawn or just feel, you know, there wasn't that same energy. No film of the Lost Spice Girls gig exists, just a few newspaper pictures. When they came off stage, they were definitely dumbfounded. They couldn't believe it. I remember going back to them and telling them, you guys were great, but don't worry about this. These are completely foreign to what you're used to seeing. These people are not going to catch this immediately, but they will. If there was a drama and anything ever went wrong, they'd go into a huddle, then they'd come out much stronger and say, we're going now, or we want to do this, or we want to do that, and you'd think, good for them, you know? Once they put their marketing campaign to work, it took basically three months for them to achieve the superstar status. So they, the, the management and record company already had the formula and knew that they were going to be big. We just jumped the gun here in Miami. Their gang mentality had won over the world, making them the most successful female group of all time. Only one thing can now loosen the grip of girl power, men. The sixth day that shook the Spice Girls is a story of true love and blind hate. It was a day that shaped the whole face of modern Britain. Hello and Heat magazine would never be the same again. Old Trafford, Manchester. Saturday, March 15th, 1997. I'll always remember when Victoria met David because it was at Manchester United and it was Victoria and Mel Chisholm. And it's really interesting because she was much more famous than he was. I used to have to ring up my husband to find out what the, the scores were and whether David had scored a goal because we'd often be working when they were playing and she always used to follow him, you know, whatever he was doing, she always wanted to know. Oh. Right, back past there, Beckham's in! And Beckham will finish it up! The engagement followed less than a year later and the quiet Spice Girl found that she had become the centre of attention and one half of a national institution. Posh and Becks. When Victoria and David got engaged, it happened at the same time where the Spice Girls were at a crisis point, really, in their career. They had been massively successful, but there wasn't really much further for them to go. They'd reached their peak. So it could have been a very different story had she not met David. It sort of began this new life for Posh. She stopped being a member of the Spice Girls and she started being the girl every woman in the country wanted to be. But the next summer, the romance lurched towards tragedy. It's a time for strong nerves on the field and I suspect with all of you at home as well, wherever you're watching. The Spice Girls were on the American leg of the world tour. Beckham was at the World Cup 
and the golden couple were about to face two life-changing moments in one day. Victoria knew that she was pregnant once we were in New York, and uh, I understand that she, you know, called David before the Argentina game, that fateful Argentina game, um, to let him know. Because of the pressures on David then, I would imagine that he wouldn't have had much time to sort of say, oh, wow, amazing. You can sort of get the impression that he was on his way. She just sort of got the news in in time. I can remember sitting in a hotel bar with Victoria and Melanie C watching the game. Hamilton's pass wasn't quite what was required, and neither was that challenge on uh, Beckham. I was filming in Prague, in the middle of the countryside, where there was a television set about that size that was... <laughs> so um, we could hear the commentary. He's taking another card out for Beckham. It's a red card for David Beckham. Everybody's pretty devastated by what happened. Beckham was off and England were out. As the press flew into a rage, the England team flew home, but the demonized Beckham wouldn't be joining them. The sense of isolation that David Beckham was reduced to was illustrated when the England team returned home from France. Once they arrived at Heathrow, they all went their separate ways and David Beckham hung around the concourse and he got another Concorde and went over to New York to see Victoria. The Spice Girls were very much secondary to the story about the fact that David Beckham was reunited with Posh Spice. He was the one that had let the nation down. How dare he be having this famous pop star girlfriend and fleeing off to New York? And in his head was, yeah, it was pretty serious that he didn't do so well. But more important than that was that they were going to have a baby and they needed to be together. Even though we were in America, we were still very aware of the despicable actions of the press back at home. And uh, I remember that being very upsetting for Victoria and for David. Drop the hate. Forgive each other. Drop the hate. 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 Can you imagine seeing an effigy of your husband being burnt outside a pub? I would, I'll always remember that picture thinking, God, you know, if you're Victoria or David's family, to see that and think, what, the nation dislike you that much? I think that was when she realised there was work life and there was love life. David, she loves him to death. It's real soulmate stuff. And she cared less about her career because something was just so much more important. She talked about it on the radio with me and was very upset. I mean, genuinely upset about it, and I can imagine so. But from arch enemy to superhero, which he is now, is incredible. Incredible. They didn't come out of it because he played better football, although he did, and she became a loving wife and mother, although she did. They came out of it because it was a triumph of, of a real spirit over terrible adversity. And that's why we all love them, because we all want to believe that a love like this exists that could totally reverse fortune. What Posh found was, you know, the ultimate every woman's dream, really. She was happy in her life. She lives in a palace, for goodness sake. It's the nearest thing to being royal without all the hassle. So, really, she didn't need the Spice Girls anymore. <laughs> Beckham wasn't the first guy to lead a Spice Girl down the aisle, for better or for worse. Mel B married one of the group's dancers, Jimmy Golzar, but it was all over within a year. We saw them getting married, we saw them getting divorced, having babies, having relationships. Um, all of these things that kind of seem to be at the opposite end of the spectrum from the kind of the girl power philosophy that so many kids had bought into. But despite the domestic upheavals, professionally, the Spice Girls were still in song. They marked the new millennium with their ninth number one. And so far, the two albums had sold over 30 million copies. It was quite a record to live up to. The Spice Girls! Well, it's a big week for the uh, releases on the album front. The Spice Girls return this week with a brand new album called Forever, and this is taken from it. And it's a little 
The Spice Girls weren't used to being second best, but on the day their third album entered the UK charts, they had to learn to live with it. Sunday, 12th of November 2000, was the seventh day that shook the Spice Girls. When that third album was released, Shock Horror, it debuted at number two. Didn't only debut at number two, it was beaten by Westlife. Westlife were the new identikit, created, quality pop boy band. And the bad news didn't end there. After that first week, it went out the top ten, which is kind of unthinkable for a Spice Girls record. If from day one you've been number one, you've been, you know, you've had this amazing success, you go to number one, and then everything's number one, number one, number one, it's kind of like, well, God, if I get a number two, that's, that's crap, isn't it? The Spice Girls aren't splitting up, are they? No, I think that's so frustrating because we've had so many lies and rumours and, you know, the press have always been at us. But, you know, with us, same old Spice Girls, yes. third album finished, and I think, you know, the British media, they've got a lot to answer for. Oh, no. I remember going to the, um, the launch party for the third album. There was a, a big Westlife party at one part of London and then there was a Spice Girls party at a big venue in town. But when Mel C arrived, she was dressed in a sort of Johnny Rotten type outfit. She stuck two fingers up to the press, pulled her tongue out and basically made quite a lot of enemies. The next day, Mel C's pictures on the front of the papers sticking her finger up and it was basically her sticking her finger up to the band and saying you know this is it I don't want to be part of this anymore so glad we made it. Time will never, never everything was right all the parts of the jigsaw were perfect uh, then there came all the problems and then Jerry leaves and then they come out with forever which is the statement isn't it we are forever yes we're strong well it won a very good album it didn't sell that many, and they're not forever. The most significant point of all for me was that they lost Simon Fuller in that process, and I don't think that Simon would have made the third album the way it was. So it, to me, it was a bit of a kind of sad ending to it all. The only cement that keeps a band like the Spice Girls together is success, and as soon as they hit hard times, it's all over. It's a rocky relationship from day one, and that's always the problem with all manufactured bands, because one of them always thinks that they're more famous than the others. What's interesting is that the two most famous Spice Girls, Victoria Beckham and Jerry Halliwell, are the two members furthest removed from the Spice Girls now. They've carved out very carefully um, different personalities and careers for themselves away from the band. The music actually became quite irrelevant. I mean, we just kind of wanted to know what they were doing in their personal lives. Not what, We didn't want to see them standing around on stage singing. Whether or not the Spice Girls will return for one last payday is still uncertain. But for now, it seems that for the biggest pop act of the last 20 years, breaking up has been cancelled due to lack of interest. I thought the biggest farce for me was when they went on to pick that award up at the Brits. The outstanding contribution to British Music Award. They've made up an award for them, haven't they? I tell you, at the end, when they sang, no one cared. It doesn't matter what anyone else says, it's about the music. Tomorrow night, getting right inside Liz Hurley's brains at nine. But back to tonight, and there were two great friends who became deadly enemies. True Stories gets the lowdown on street buddy rappers Biggie and Tupac next. Claire.